morning. Take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at a verse that we actually looked at a couple of weeks ago, but I want to come back to it this morning. But before I get started, first of all, I want to tell you how glad I am to be back. I was uh, gone last Sunday. I was preaching in in Steubenville, Ohio, back uh, in my hometown. Got to preach for a good friend of mine um, and uh, at Grace Point Community Church in uh, Steubenville and had a great time with that. Didn't get a lot of time there. I was there less than 24 hours. I got in on late Saturday evening and had to leave about Sunday on noon. About as soon as time we got done eating lunch, I uh, had to head for Lynchburg, Virginia for a uh, conference I went to in Liberty. Got to see a lot of my old stomping grounds through West Virginia. In fact, I found some new places that I didn't know about. I'm going to warn you, if you ever drive through the state of West Virginia uh, using Google Maps, don't. <laughs> All right. It took me to places that I hadn't. I, I'm, I'm from that area. I pastored in West Virginia for a long time. I thought I knew every part of the state. It found parts of the state I didn't know existed. All right. And, uh, but I uh, got through there and uh, good to be back home though. Good to be back here with you all this morning. I do also want to welcome, wish a happy birthday to Betty Morris. She didn't know I was going to do that, but today is Betty Morris's birthday. Betty, would you stand up? Let everybody see you. Give Betty a big round of applause. All right, so we're so grateful for that. Over the last several weeks, we've uh, been looking at the doctrine of the Trinity, and we've been thinking about the importance of this Trinity. Almost every evangelical believer acknowledges that the Trinity is one of our essential doctrines. It's one of the ways that we test for heresy. Uh, if you're looking uh, at, at trying to determine whether someone's an Orthodox Christian, one well, of the very first tests that you use is to say, well, what, what do you believe about the Trinity? So if you're looking at a particular religious group, what do they believe about the Trinity? And most evangelicals, according to a recent study done by Lifeway Christian Research, 93% of evangelical Christians are able to correctly identify the orthodox Christian view of the Trinity, which is that there is one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The problem is, when you dig down deeper into that belief, that same study shows that there is vast confusion over the details. Most uh, Christians cannot explain the Trinity, and they cannot pick up sort of the minute differences. Now, part of the problem with that is the way that we teach the Trinity. A lot of times what happens when we teach the Trinity in church, we'll have a new believers class, or we'll have a message, and we'll sort of say, one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then that's about as far as we go. The reason that doesn't work is at our heart as evangelical believers, we are practical people. We like to see how doctrine works. We want to see how we can put it into practice in our daily life. And one of the things that we fail to do on the Trinity is to show how it actually works out in our Christian life. How do we experience the Trinity in our daily life? So what we've been doing over the last several weeks is talking about the ways that we experience the Trinity through the Christian life. First of all, the very beginning of the Christian life is an experience of the Trinity. In our salvation, all three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all at work in our salvation. The Father chooses us, the Son redeems us, the Holy Spirit seals us. Uh, you can go back to Ephesians 1 and see all three members of the Trinity there at work. Also, in the production of the Bible, when we look at the Bible, the Bible itself and, and our experience with the Bible is an experience of the Trinity. The Father, uh, uh, the, the Scripture points us to the Father through the Son and was inspired by the Holy Spirit. All of Scripture ultimately is God-breathed, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and points us to Jesus. When we pray, we looked at two weeks ago, when we pray, we pray to God the Father through Jesus the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. So all through our Christian life, we see this sort of experience of the Trinity. This week, I want to build on this theme a little further, and I want to talk about worship. One of the most vivid memories I have as a child growing up in church 
was that every single Sunday of my childhood, our church took up the offering in the exact same way, all right? Here's what would happen. And about the middle of our service, all right, four very stern-looking gentlemen would walk to the front of the church, the pastor would pray, and then they would go take up the offering. When they would get to the end of the aisles, the worship leader would start, walk to the front, do this, everyone would stand, and we would sing the doxology. Now, there are, by the way, many doxologies, but we called it the doxology. You'll remember it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below, a song we almost never think about. Did you ever think about what you're doing in that song? You're actually commanding angels in that song. Did you know that? You're commanding the angels, praise God. And then we close that line, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And about the time they would say Holy Ghost, they would lay the offering down on the, on the, uh, uh, the, the pulpit and we would continue with services. That happened every single Sunday of my life growing up. It was just expected. When you get to the end of the uh, offering, they get done taking it up. We sing the doxology. That's it. When I went into the ministry later on, I got to sit down one day with my pastor growing up. His name was Warren Baker. And, um, and Warren was a, a wonderful, wonderful pastor, has made an incredible impact on my life. And um, so I sat down, I said, Warren, I always appreciated it. Why did you do that in the service, though? Why did you build that around the service? Why did you always do that? And he made a statement to me. He said, I did that not just to have a transition in the worship. There was no practical, like, um, just ascetic value to doing it that way. But he said, what I wanted to do was every single Sunday have a reference to the Trinity in the worship service. And that's the way he did that, was to just simply say that simple reference of praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He wanted that in the service, and he wanted it to be a part of our worship experience. Now, by the way, I am not here um, uh, beginning to advocate that we do that necessarily, but what I am saying is, is that we should have a Trinitarian shape to our worship. That the Trinity should be a factor and a shape for how we worship. Now, we kind of talked about this verse a couple of weeks ago, but in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul lays out sort of a shape for how we approach God. I want you to look at what he says here in verse 18. I'm going to use a lot of scripture this morning. You can write them down. Most of them will be on the uh, uh, overhead. Uh, The ones that aren't, just write them down uh, so you're not chasing all over the scripture. But in verse 18, listen to what he says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. He says, for through him, now the him there that he's talking about is Jesus. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now, we talked in a couple weeks ago, but that's how we pray. When we pray, we come to the Father through Jesus. The only means that we have to come before God, because we're sinners, because we're fallen, broken humans, uh, the only way we can come before God is through Jesus. We have to come through his redemptive work. We have to come through the salvation that he has provided us, but we come before God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that holds true in prayer. When we take our prayer requests and we lift them up, we're praying to God the Father through Jesus who is interceding on our behalf and making our access to God possible, but we're also praying uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's guiding us. He's leading us. Well, that same model, that same basic picture happens in our worship experience, Really, prayer and worship go right hand to hand together. They are very closely uh, related. Let's think about this for just a moment and think about the importance of worship. Very often, we have reduced worship to only what we're doing here right now. 
to the Sunday morning service, the Sunday evening service, occasionally the Wednesday night service. We kind of limit it just to the corporate side of things. But if you look in the scripture, worship is a central activity. It is a very important purpose. In fact, According to Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7, it's the reason that God created us. And you stop and think about that. Have you ever asked the question, why am I here? (laughs) Anybody ever asked that question? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Why did God put me on this earth? What is my purpose? Well, I can tell you at least partially what that purpose is. According to Scripture, it is to worship God. God made you for the purpose of worshiping and honoring and glorifying him. And let me say this to you. That's your highest purpose. You may have a lot of other purposes uh, for which, you know, uh, God has made you. I'm quite convinced God made me, you know what I'm saying, to preach his word and to pastor a church. But first and foremost, my greatest task in life and your greatest task in life is to glorify and honor God. So he reminds us in Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7, we're created for his glory. We're created for the purpose of worship. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, uh, or rather 3 through 14, reminds us that God's purpose in saving us repeatedly in that passage, I think it's three or four times he says it in this passage, is for his glory. In other words, when Jesus, when God concocted the plan of salvation in eternity past. Ultimately, he was looking to save you so that he himself would be glorified. He's created us for the purpose of worship. John 1, 14 says that Jesus came to reveal God's glory. Philippians 2, 1 through 11 reminds us that one day every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's important because God's passion for his own glory is what fuels our understanding of worship, should fuel our understanding of worship. Now let me tell you what's really happened in the church in America. What fuels our understanding of worship normally in the American church is what stirs people up. What do we like? What makes me feel good? I, I'm going to tell you a little secret here. This, is a, this isn't a secret. Everybody knows this. If you're around me for any length of time, you know I like the Beatles. I don't like the Beatles. I love the Beatles. Uh, John uh, uh, and I taught out at Shawnee Community College out at the Extension Center this last year. He was in the classroom before me and, and would be the only person in the room after me, all right? And so one day I walked in and he had a history of Western music on, on uh, the board and I erased it. He was all wrong about it. Now, I know John says he's an expert in music, but he obviously didn't know what he was talking about. Here's the way the the history of music is for real, kids, okay? There was noise. Paul McCartney met John Lennon. They formed the Beatles. There was music. 1969, the Beatles broke up, and there was noise. All right? That's the history of music. I wrote that on his board. He did not like it, all right? However, I like that music because it touches me, and you like the kind of music because it touches you. But I'm going to say this to you. That's not what worship is. Worship aims to touch not your heart, but the heart of all of God. It aims to glorify and honor him. So the big question is, isn't what do I like? It's what does God like? What does God want? What's going to touch the heart of God in the middle of our worship? Now, one of the things that's kind of happened, if you look, is there has been, by the way, we're not going to issue, we're not going to get into style this morning because style is just a product of humanity. Did you know that there has been a debate on the style of worship from the time the church first began? We like to think today that we're having this worship discussion and it's brand new. It's not. If you go back and you look uh, uh, all through the history of the church, all the way back, there has been a debate over whether instruments should be used in the church or not. We'll say, well, that's just, that's the church of Christ. No, that's not really. They were having that discussion in the 1400s. 
They also had that discussion in the 800s. They also had that discussion in the 300s. And I'm pretty sure they had it before that. All right? They had arguments about what kind of music. One of, the, one of the things that really stirred up and caused some controversy when Charles Spurgeon was preaching was Spurgeon actually reworked a couple of psalms, the language of a few psalms, and had the worship leaders sing them. And that was a problem because people didn't write songs back then. Everything that was done in the church, they just took the book of psalms and they sang it back. And there was a controversy over it. And today we have a controversy over worship. But see, I'm going to say this to you. That is Satan's argument. That is Satan's way of keeping worship man-centered, man-focused, rather than freeing us to look and say, what is it that's going to touch the heart of God? Now, I want to say this to you. Uh, If we look at, at, at worship, we find one of the greatest concerns that I have is that there is a neglect of the doctrine of Trinity in our worship. I I thought that was true, so last year I did a study on this. What I did was I went and found out according to CCLI, CCLI is the licensing, the copyright licensing company that license all Christian music. If we're gonna use any Christian music basically uh, in our worship services, uh, we have to go through CCLI and we pay a fee every year to go through CCLI and to be able to use worship. Uh, The hymnal, the reason the hymnal costs you money is because part of what happens is they have to pay CCLI for the copyright use, all right? And they keep track of what all songs are being sung in the churches across the world. There has to be a report of what songs are being sung, you know, not for theological purposes, but for copyright purposes. So I went and looked, and I took their top 50 songs. These are the most, the 50 most used songs according to CCLI, in the churches across America. Here's what I found. 34 of those songs refer to God in a general sense, without naming any specific member of the Trinity. In other words, the word that's used there is just God. And by the way, that's not a problem. That's not necessarily a problem. It's fine just to refer to all three members of the Trinity as God. When we say God, we're referring to all three, all right? But listen to this. Only two of the songs specifically mention the Father. 26 refers specifically to the Son and the work of redemption, which is good. And five refer to the Holy Spirit. Only one song out of those 50 specifically mentions all three members of the Trinity. And so what I I concluded from that is, is three things. Number one, there's a strong emphasis on the church in America on the redemptive work of Christ. That's good, by the way. One of our central focuses in our worship should be the redemptive work of Jesus, amen? That's the central focus of Scripture is his redemptive work, is the fact that we are sinners and that God sent his son to die on the cross that we could have eternal life and forgiveness of sin. That's the central focus and theme of the whole Bible. So it makes absolute sense that in our worship, most of our songs are going to talk about redemption and about the work of Jesus. But there's also an alarming trend towards a more generalized, generic reference to God in worship. Now, here's what concerns me about that. We learn more theology from our music than we do from Sunday school. That has always been true. That's not new. (laughs) That's always been true. That's why for many, many centuries, all of the music that was sung in the churches were written most of the time by pastors, most of the time written by musicians employed inside the church, but that changed. Here in America in the 1920s, we started making most of our church music is not written in the church, it is written by a publishing company. All right, now here's the thing is, Sometimes those songs lack theological specifics. We like general stuff, do we not? We don't like to get into the details. I am absolutely fascinated by math. Carl, I, Carl's an engineer and loves math. I love the concept of math, but you know what? I hate the details of math. 
I can't actually add, subtract, multiply, or divide worth a lick. So I'm a preacher, all right? But I love the theory. I'm afraid that's the way we are sometimes in church. We like the generalities, but we don't get into the specifics. And, and here's the deal. When it comes to matters of faith, details matter. Amen? They matter a great deal. And so we need to be very careful. There's a third observation, is that much of our worship has become man-centered rather than God-centered. In more than half of the songs that I analyzed, the main focus of the song was on the person, not on God. But that's not what we see in Scripture. That doesn't mean that there aren't songs of testimony and songs that have a focus where uh, the worshiper is saying, God, you have blessed me in this incredible way. Thank you. God, I am having this problem. Help me. Those are the You'll find those in the Psalms. But the vast majority of the worship recorded for us in Scripture is God-centered. Because worship plays such a major role in the doctrine and spiritual formation of the next generation, the fact that we're not being specific in our songs means that in the future generations, we will likely have a doctrinal slide away from the Trinity. And I'll prove that by the fact that there has been a slide in the last 50 years. What has happened? As the church has become more general in its worship, our understanding of the Trinity has fallen to the side. Now think about what that means. In practical terms, I'm about to say something that's going to in practical terms, the majority of evangelicals in America today functionally practice heresy. It's not biblical doctrine. And part of that is because we're not paying a close enough attention. So let me talk to you a little bit about this Trinitarian shape of worship. How should we do it? Uh, again, I'm not going back and saying we need to do what my pastor did of sticking it into the middle of every service, because to be honest with you, we heard it every Sunday. I never knew why we did it that way until I was 25 and asked the pastor, why do we sing that song every single Sunday? And he told me. In other words, it really didn't accomplish its purpose. It really didn't teach us what it was all about. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to come back and examine what worship really is. And I want to say three things to you. Number one, worship is made possible by Jesus. The very fact that we can worship is really a product of kind of two things in the Bible. Number one, we are created to worship. We are made in his image. God originally made Adam and Eve for the purpose of honor and glorifying God. But something terrible occurred. In the garden in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned, and, and the very purpose for which they were created for suddenly is thwarted, suddenly brought to a halt. They can no longer worship because of the presence of sin. You can't come into the presence of God and have sin in your life. So something radical had to happen, and you and I know what that is, that Jesus came to die on the cross to give us access, to bring us into the presence of God. The reason we can worship today is only made possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. By the way, that's even illustrated in the Old Testament. You can see it all through the Old Testament. Or stop thinking about Old Testament worship for a minute. They didn't worship in a church building the way you and I do. They worshiped at a tabernacle or a temple. And everything about that tabernacle or the temple, depending on what period of time you're looking at, said to the worshiper, you can't come into the presence of God. Stay out. They built a tent around the Holy of Holies that said, there's where God resides. But only one person one time a year can go into there. The rest of you have to stay out. And the priest could come into this little outer court, but if you were an average Gentile you couldn't, or, or an average Jew, you couldn't even come into there. You had to stay outside of the, the temple uh, proper, out in the courtyard. If you were a Gentile, you couldn't come in at all. Everything about that design of worship says, stay out of the presence of God. 
you can't come in here. But one time a year, the high priest would take an offering and he would bring it before God and he would offer it for the sacrifice for the sins of the people. That is the Old Testament picture of what Jesus came to do. He died in your place. And now, here's what happened. When Jesus died, that veil that separated everyone from the presence of God, the Bible says was torn from the top to the bottom, indicating that now you and I can come into God's presence. Isn't that good news? When we worship, when we pray, we're able to come into God's presence, not because we're great people, not because we're good guys, but because Jesus died in our place. And that's great news because that means that no matter who you are, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter how much sin you've done in your life, if you come to Jesus, he will save you and he will give you access to God. That's awesome news. And so when we look at, 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 at the New Testament, we see that our access to God is made possible by Jesus, but also he becomes our motivation for worship. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, if you go back and you study Romans... Basically, from chapter 1 all the way through the end of chapter 11, he's talking about the mercies of God. The mercy of God is the grace and the love and the forgiveness that we are given by God through Jesus. He says, I, this is, I appeal to you based on the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul says worship is more, brothers and sisters, than just showing up. It's not just about attending. Oh, brothers and sisters, what's killing the American church is we think showing up is enough. We think that just merely presence in the service, somehow by osmosis, God will come in and saturate our lives. That's not how it works. He says we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, just as in the Old Testament, they brought the sacrifice, that dead sacrifice, before God and offered it and said, here it is, God. You and I present our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices. We come before him and say, God, this is what worship looks like. Here I am, send me. Here I am, God. Whatever you want to do, do it with me. Do it through me. Do it in me. God, I am yours. Here's what we do in worship, though. God, here's what I want. <laughs> Here's what I'd like to have. My son is looking for a truck. He wants to buy a truck. So yesterday, we were on his way back from a swim meet, and we stopped at a dealership, and he was looking at a truck. And you know how young guys are. We all, we all are. We go in there, and we want the most souped-up model of truck we can possibly find, right? I want everything on that thing. The pro, and that's how we treat salvation. Now, what he found out real quickly is he can't afford everything. What he can afford is a 1965 Ford truck with no motor in it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He can afford much more than that. But what happens? We come before God like we go to a car dealer. God, this is all of the features and benefits I'd like to have. Mark that out. God, that's not worship. Worship says, here I am, God. Here's my life, use me. And the motivation for that is the fact that Jesus put on human flesh. He bled and died for you on the cross. He rose again. He has ascended to the Father. He is coming back someday. And based on all of the mercies that God has shown you, you go, God, based on everything you've done for me, whatever you want, God, I'm yours. Here I am, God, use me in whatever way you want. 
And then he reminds us in the rest of that passage that he says, he says that it is our, uh, our spiritual um, act of worship. He's reminding us that, that um, worship is more than just emotion. It involves our emotions, true, but also our minds, our wills. We've almost forgotten the fact that if we've truly worshiped God, we should walk out of here differently than when we came in. And so he's reminding us that we worship, our worship is made possible by Jesus, but also our worship is ultimately focused on glorifying God. And think about that. If we're following Jesus, that the glory of the Father is going to be utmost in our hearts. Think about what Jesus did. Everything Jesus did while he was here on earth was done in order to glorify God. That's what he says in John 6, 38. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, listen, when I came to earth, I didn't come to do what I want to do. I came to do the will of the Father. In fact, in another passage, he says it this way. He says, I do what I see my Father doing. The things that I see, whatever I see my Father doing, that's the things that I'm involved in. And if you think about that, that's our focus. If we're following Jesus, our focus automatically is going to be not on our own preferences, not on glorifying ourselves, not on getting our own needs met, but rather our focus on worship should be about making, uh, about honoring God. Again, we're created for his glory. We've been saved for his glory. Therefore, we should focus our lives on his glory. Wouldn't that change the way that we deal with church? Wouldn't that just change the way we deal with life in general? If every decision we are making, the first thing we ask is this question, will this glorify and honor God? Will this ultimately point people to Jesus? Will this honor God? God. Worship is not just one of the many activities we do in the church. It's really the central reason for why we're here. And it's more than just what we do in this room. So, I'm going to be very honest. I hear people do this all the time. Well, pastor, you know, and they'll, they'll separate. The worship is when we're singing, and then there's something else that happens. That's not true. The worship is everything we do. When we send a mission team to Haiti, it is an act of worship. When we serve in Vacation Bible School, it is an act of worship. Because see, worship in the Bible is really not as much about singing. The words, literally, the word worship means to serve in Scripture. And so the idea is, is it's not just about doing the things we do in what we call the worship time, but rather it's everything we do. Did you know that when you're at work, you're also worshiping God or not worshiping God, depend on, on what your attitude is? Everything is to be given in service of God the Father. The fact that style comes to the forefront in our discussion so often is the best indication that something is dreadfully wrong in our hearts. Our sinful, prideful flesh demands its own preferences. I was at a restaurant the other day. And I'm just being honest with you. I've honestly never gotten bad food or bad service at a restaurant. Because here's my philosophy on it. If somebody is bringing me food to a table, praise God. Amen? I didn't have to make it. I'll eat it. I've had better food. Cliff and I talk about this all the time. My philosophy on pizza is there's good pizza and there's better pizza. There's no bad pizza. doesn't exist in the entire world. Why? Because it's just the nature of it. Well, when we come and we worship, we have to get our minds focused. I was at a restaurant the other day, and there was this guy. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what his problem was. But everything the waitress did was wrong. And he was demanding vigorously that he be attended to exactly the way he thought that it should be done. It was at a Panda Express. I'm going to be honest with you. You went to a Panda Express, and you thought you were going to get good service. Something's wrong with you. You have a screw loose somewhere in your brain. 
It is teenagers serving food out of walks. What the heck? What did you expect? You're not at the Four Seasons here, man. You're not at some fancy restaurant. You're not at McDonald's or something like that. You know, Panda Express. And the the guy doesn't like the fact that they have to refill the bowl, and it's going to take a couple of minutes for them to refill the bowl so he can get whatever he was ordering, and he was belligerent about it. We laugh when that happens at Panda Express, and it happens every single day in the life of American Christians. And we're asking the wrong question. It's not what do I like, but what will honor God? That doesn't mean our content of our worship ultimately is not important. We have to focus on his attributes. When we worship God, we should be spending more time focusing on what he's like. A good examples of that would be Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, the whole psalm is a praise of God's power as uh, expressed and as demonstrated in creation. In Isaiah 6, the angels in heaven are worshiping before the throne of God. And they're not paying attention to themselves, but rather they're declaring the holiness of God. In fact, every time we see worship happening in the scripture, there's something you should notice. It is always focused on who God is and what he's like and what he's doing. We should focus on uh, the great works of God. Psalms 105, verse 22, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all of his wondrous works. When we worship, not only are we saying, God, you are gracious and you're merciful and you're holy and you're righteous, his attributes, but we're also saying, God, you have demonstrated your love to me in these ways. Go back and read the Psalms and see how many times those Psalms go back and praise God for what he did in creation, what he did in the Exodus how he was delivering the various kings. Every time they'd have a major crisis, they'd write a praise song about how God brought us through that and how God worked. So our, 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 our worship of God must focus on his attributes and on his great works and then ultimately on the redemptive work of Christ. Because ultimately, it may seem strange, but we glorify God the Father when we focus on the redemptive work of Christ. Because ultimately, Jesus was simply carrying out the will of the Father. And so we come and we sing of, his, his, of the cross, and we sing of his redemption, and we sing of his grace. We generally do a pretty good job in the evangelical church of keeping Jesus in the focus. We do pretty well at that. If you look at most of our songs, you most of them, we're going to focus very heavily on redemptive. But we've got to make sure we focus on all of these other things. Now, let me bring a third thing. Um, Worship is ultimately empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it is made possible by Jesus. It is focused on the Father. But then it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we get this all mixed up in church. We get the idea that the Holy Spirit sometimes shows up in church and sometimes does not show up in church. That's incorrect. The Holy Spirit is always present when the people of God gather for worship. The only real question is, do you recognize that he's here? That's kind of like being filled with the Holy Spirit. People say, boy, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Acting as if it's something that's unusual in the life of the believer. But that's not true. The question isn't getting more of the Holy Spirit when we're filled with the Spirit, but rather yielding our lives to his control. Yeah, it, it, the, the real question is not how much more of the Spirit do I need. That's, I have all of the Holy Spirit indwelling my heart, and so do you if you're a believer. The question is, how much of me does he have? And in the reality, one of the reasons why we don't experience the Holy Spirit in our worship service is A, we're looking for the wrong thing. We're looking for pure emotion. We're looking for something dynamic. Here's what's amazing. If you read the accounts of the great revivals in the history of the church, they didn't know it was happening when it started. That tells you something. It wasn't just the pure emotion. I hear people every once in a while walk out and go, wow, the Holy Spirit really moved in that worship service. And I'll ask them this question, how do you know? Well, I could feel him. 
Maybe. But here's how you know when the Holy Spirit really moved in the service. Did it change you on Monday morning? Did it change you on Tuesday? Did it result in a difference in the way you behave and in the way you think? That's what the Holy Spirit is all to aim for. Well, again, in worship, again, into the practical, it's not wrong to directly address the Holy Spirit in worship. As I told you, of the top 50 uh, songs that we sing uh, uh, across America in the churches today, five of those, those top 50 songs mention the Holy Spirit directly. It's not wrong to mention the Holy Spirit or address Him wrong, but that's not the main pattern of Scripture. The main pattern of Scripture is that the Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. In fact, let me say this to you very bluntly. If you're in a worship service and the Holy Spirit seems to only be drawing attention to himself, that ain't the Holy Spirit. I was in West Virginia too long. You see what happened to me? I ain't the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't point to himself, but he points to Jesus. You say, prove that to me, preacher. Well, I will. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the helper, now the word helper there is a clear reference to the Holy Spirit, but he chooses that word for a very important reason. It's the Greek word parakletos. And parakletos means someone who comes alongside of you. It was used in a number of ways. One of my favorite ways is it was used to refer to a soldier who was helping an injured soldier across the battlefield. So let's say you were in a battle and you got your leg stabbed in an ancient war and one of your comrades came along and he grabbed you and he picked you up and put his arms around you and lifted you and helped you off the battlefield. He was acting as your parakletos, your helper. It's also used in reference to uh, someone who comes and comforts someone in mourning. That's why sometimes this word is translated as comforter in Scripture. And so it's reminding us that the Holy Spirit comes along. But look what he says. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He says the Holy Spirit is going to come from the Father, but he is going to point you to me. John 16, verse 13 and 15 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But listen, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is always going to come along and point you towards me. Just as Jesus served as an obedient agent of God the Father by carrying out the role of redemption. The Holy Spirit comes and, and his job is to point people to Jesus. His job is to guide us into a deeper understanding of Jesus. His, his purpose in life and his purpose in existence is to come and, and show you what you need to know about Christ. To point you to Jesus. And so when we're talking about spirit-empowered worship, we're ultimately talking about worship that is going to be driven by the Holy Spirit and pointing us to Jesus. He empowers us ultimately for worship. Philippians 3 says that we worship by the Spirit. See, worship is more than just a physical, mental, emotional thing. It is ultimately spiritual. We come in here and we place ourselves before God and the Holy Spirit takes. And just as he does in prayer, remember I told you in prayer, sometimes we don't know what we need to pray for, but the Holy Spirit comes and he empowers us to pray. He kind of comes and he takes what's on our heart and he translates it uh, to God the Father. He does the same thing in worship. I'll be very honest with you, last Sunday, I had a wonderful, wonderful worship experience, but it didn't start out that way. I got in the car Saturday morning to drive from here to Steubenville, Ohio. is a long drive. I got to my mom's house about 8 o'clock Saturday evening. I hung out at hers for a little while, jumped back in the car, drove across the river to my sister's house where I stayed overnight. Got up early the next morning, uh, 
hectic because I didn't have a lot of time to spend with my family. I only get to see them maybe once or twice a year. And, and so we want to talk. We want to hang out. So at the breakfast table, my brother-in-law did the cardinal mistake with me. He made me breakfast on a Sunday morning. My rule is I preach till I get hungry. If I am well fed, you are in trouble. So he made me bacon. He made me eggs. He made me toast. We sat there. We talked. But now I'm kind of full. I'm, honestly, I was kind of sleepy by the time I get to worship service. And their church is different than ours. They sit at round tables. It's very, 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 did I emphasize very enough? Contemporary. All right? I was dressed like this, and I was by far the best dressed person in the room. Dude, when I'm the best dressed person in the room, you're in trouble. I love their pastor. He's probably going to watch this and never invite me to come back again. But he wears shorts. He wears sandals. It is laid back. It is not me. And we're worshiping, and I'm tired. And honestly, I was in a little bit of a bad mood because really what I wanted to do at that time was just hang out with my mom and my sister. And I just wanted to have a little more time to spend with family. And I knew as soon as I'm done preaching, I got to jump in the car and I got to drive all the way to Lynchburg, Virginia. And I'm going to get maybe an hour to spend with. And I just can, can, you just, can we just be honest for a moment? Forget that I'm your pastor. Do you know that sometimes that you walk into worship and you just ain't feeling it? And I really wasn't feeling it. And most of the, ser- I couldn't tell you what they sang in the service. I'm sure it was wonderful, it was good. I really wasn't paying attention to the worship. I was just trying desperately to get my heart in tune with God. And finally, at some point in that service, I just said, you know what, God? I don't like how this weekend has had to go. It's so fast, and I don't have much time, and I'm not getting to see my family, and it's not really working out the way I wanted it to. But God, you brought me here for this, for something. God, you're in control. And I'm just going to get up, and I'm going to say what you give me to say. And Lord, please. Use and you know what happened? Somewhere in the midst of that, God began to work in my heart. It wasn't a great emotion thing. I was just as tired when I left. I really wasn't feeling it. I got done preaching, and the pastor says, you can't believe how timely that sermon was. I'm thinking, dude, I preached the same sermon I did last Sunday at my church. You know why? Because I'm lazy. I didn't, I couldn't find, a, I just, it wasn't coming a new, so, so I preached what I preached here last Sunday to them, or two Sundays ago with them, and somehow that was the right thing. I, I'm not telling you I hope that happens every single Sunday, but what I'm telling you is it really wasn't about me. He says, you don't believe how timely that sermon is to us. I had people coming up going, oh, we needed that so desperately. They are faced uh, with making some monumental decisions for their church about location and about service times and about number of services and all kinds of things. And I'm sitting there going, that's amazing. Because if you had asked me going in there emotionally, was I feeling God? The answer was no. Walking out, I was like, God, you're awesome. You're awesome. You spoke through me even when I was too dumb to know what you were going to say. And two, are you getting what I'm saying? Sometimes just showing up in worship and you present yourself before God and say, here I am, God. Man, I'm not necessarily feeling it. I'm in a weird location. It doesn't feel like what I'm used to. It doesn't feel comfortable to me. But God, here I am. Speak to me and use me and help me to experience you. And you know what happens? Somehow in that still small way, he shows up. Amen? Amen. These guys that go to Haiti, they experience that a lot. They experience it even in a weirder way. Because they go down there and don't understand. Cliff thinks he can speak Haitian. He he comes back. Next week, he'll come back. All we'll hear is Creole from this guy. He'll go to lunch. For some reason, he'll think the Spanish guy is over at El Tequila. You know what I'm saying? He'll speak Creole. He'll speak Creole to everybody. All right? 
he knows a little Creole. He knows a little bit about what's going on because he's been there so often. Most of the time, these guys go and they don't know what's going on. But yet, God still works through that somehow. Amen? God is at work. We experience the Trinity, all three members of the Trinity, when we worship. Now, let me tell you where that starts. You cannot worship God until you first come to him for forgiveness and salvation through his son. It all starts at that moment when you're willing to say, Father, I have sinned against you. You got to own up to it. You got to admit, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm ruined. I can't get there on my own. But Father, here I am. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And I'm ready to turn my life over to him. And you put your trust in him. You know what happens? He saves you. And he comes in and takes up residence in your life. And he enables you to worship. And it changes everything. It changes everything. It starts with a relationship with Christ. If you don't know him today, I want to invite you to come to know him. If you say, Pastor, I'm not a member of the church, but I need to be, come. We'll talk to you about that. If you need to be baptized, whatever it is, you come this morning. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the way that you lead and guide us. Thank you for your word. I pray that today we will have experienced you when we walk out of here. Lord Jesus, I pray today, if there's anyone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that this might be the day that they repent of their sins and they place their trust in you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and work, speak to hearts. Whatever the desires is, whatever the need is today, I pray that, Lord, you would speak to us. I pray that your will would be done. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.